That's it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. Actually, I, I've seen lots of interesting talk today. And the, the, so today, what I mean, the, especially I, I found that the, if you really want to, to assimilate that data efficiently, you would also need a good uh, a, a framework which incorporates the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the physics of the system. So here I'm going to actually introduce, uh, introduce such, a, uh, such a system, which I call, which I call quadrilinear approximation. I found that this is a very actually flexible template, physical template that you can utilize using the data that you have. So the what I'm going to do, I'm going to introduce this framework, and then I'm going to show that it can be used actually to extrapolate the data up to very high random number that you, uh, you can't actually simulate with the state of uh, art of the supercomputer. So that's what I'm going to do. So. Hey, let me just briefly start. Uh, let me start with uh, introducing by introducing quadrilinear approximation. So I'm going to introduce the, this this approximation in a very general form, following this paper by Marston and Kinney and Tobias, published in PRL in 2016. So what I'm going to do is you have a you you have a given flow field and you decompose it into two. So one is the state that you are most interested in, but the other is the state you want to play with the model. OK, so if you write down the equation for both, you can uh, write down the equation for the first and you can and the second equation is given in this form here. And so here P1 is a projection operator onto the first state and P2 is again the projection operator to the second small scale state. Here I'm going to assume that N is, is again the nonlinear nonlinear term for the small scale state equation. So here I'm going to assume that this is just like something that you can actually play with. OK, so what is nice is that it offers an enormous amount of flexibility to study physics and modeling. First of all, you can do decomposition, whatever you like to do. It all depends on your purpose. So they, you can do conventional ranges of decomposition, but you can do something more sophisticated. The second uh, advantage is that you, we have seen from the Denise talk, Denise talk in this morning, is that if you have a small scale state, it's actually a linearized equation uh, about the, the larger scale state, which means you can also apply many stability methods for small scale state, for example, redundant modes or stochastic response modes, or even more sophisticated one like harmonic balance um, uh, uh, method that the Jordi Rigasse and uh, Denise are doing. And also the N is also the another thing that we can play with. So the, so the N can be computed in a data driven way or you can you can combine with other physical for, for physics based model like the 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 Eddie Biscosti model or whatsoever model. So this is the, the key thing that uh, that that this approximation offers the flexibility in the approximating the system. So one of the most well-known uh, approximation is stand, uh, actually stems from the uh, uh, Bill Marcus back in 1950. And you decompose actually full field into two, mean and the others, and then you get the equation for larger scale, and you get the linearized equation for the small scale state. And then what Bill Marcus proposed was actually for the linearly unstable flow where the small scale state is linear, shows linear instability. So then what you're going to do you determine the, the largest scale state by applying the marginal stability criterion because the, the flow that you want to study must be statistically stationary. So therefore, there's no way that the unsteady term contribute to the system. Then you get actually nice, you can, you get, you can nice get, nicely get some solution. And this technique was really applied to, uh, by the, uh, the, the, e the people from EPFL, uh, the group of Francois Gallet, and he, he and his, his student, Martin uh, Monte Lugo, and he applied this to the blood body wake, and they showed the very promising results at the range of number. So the, the issue is that, but it is technically, is that it's only really applicable for linearly unstable flow. And also, if you have a multiple eigenvalues of interest, uh, that could be potentially problematic, because you have to find, you have to do the same for different, shooting the different eigenvalues. And third is that the, the technique is in general not actually suitable for high Reynolds number flow because the APU increase the Reynolds number. So N is going to be very important because it, it is the term which generates the energy cascade and turbulent dissipation. Okay, 
So the that's the, the, the one of the technique. But the there was also another technique proposed for the linearly stable flow. Uh, this was this actually goes back to the back in 1991 by Horan Smith, who proposed the to apply the same marginal stability for the secondary flow, secondary instability equation. So now what he has done here is that he decomposed the flow field into, he, in this case, is streamwise average field, but you can actually generalize this in a different way. So the first equation is dealing with the nonlinear primary instability equation, but the second equation is dealing with the secondary instability equation, and you apply again marginal stability criterion, then you will see that this equation nicely approximates some of the nice uh, non poor nonlinear solution of ratio flow, for example. Again, it, it actually shows excellent capability for some uh, uh, non exact nonlinear solution to the Navier Stokes equations, but in general, it's not a good approximation to turbulence, even at low Reynolds number. So, the other flexible approximation was actually proposed by the, uh, the Brian Farrell. Uh, and what you do, again, you utilize the same uh, decomposition and you solve the larger scale state. But the small scale state, you solve the small scale state together, but in a minimal manner. So you're not, you, you don't have to put lots of degree of freedom. You drastically reduce the degree of freedom for the small scale state. So now in that way, you achieve the very low dimensionality of the system. And what is nice about this system, it actually generates the surface sustaining turbulence in that case. And so it doesn't require any linear instability, instability to have uh, some non trivial solutions. And, and can be also dealt with more flexibly. If you just, you can just ignore it simply, but you can also model with the white noise. But still, if you ignore the N, the, it, it's very difficult to deal with uh, the high range of flow with this particular approximations. Okay. So all these approximation, I should mention, there's no data in it. So now I'm what I'm going to, so the, that's the key thing that you have to remember. Here, I'm going to show how bad actually is this quadrilinear approximation if you don't have any capability of, uh, if you don't have any data. So this is a, uh, the, what is called the bifurcation diagram for the a, a one of the nonlinear solution of the QF flow, uh, compute first actually computed, reported by the Masato Nagata back in 1990. So, the, so here is the Reynolds number of the plane QF flow, and this is a dissipation of the system. And you see that the, the, the pool solution of Nagata solution computed from DNS actually uh, uh, shows non-negligible deviation from the data coming from quadrilinear approximation, although the some part, the quadrilinear approximation does a really great job. If you look at the, the, uh, the, the poor state, uh, bifurcation of a poor state, like the poor flow variable, you see that 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 the in the in the DNS you see the the bifurcation cascade. So this is a setting of the bifurcation, and there is a secondary bifurcation coming in, and then they 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 develop into periodic orbit, and eventually uh, with the, through the periodic doubling cascade, it goes to turbulence. But the quadrilinear system you do see exactly same, but the, you see that the, the they are actually largely uh, the transition range of is largely actually increase. So there it shows a non-negligible uh, uh, difference. So the difference. So, so the, the problem that we have, the quadrilinear approximation gives us uh, the reasonably good approximation to the given dynamic systems or uh, the fluid system, especially at low Reynolds numbers. But it is going to be a problematic if you increase the Reynolds number. So here, what I'm going to propose here is that we're going to use a kind of minimal data to, to, to guide the quadrilinear approximation, especially for linearly stable shear flows. And I'm going to combine this with uh, some, some uh, stochastic mode, which is uh, similar to resonance mode that Denis utilized this morning. And I'm going to apply this technique to turbulent channel flow uh, up to very high Reynolds numbers. Okay. So this is the flow configuration. So we have uh, two wall, parallel walls, walls, lower walls and upper walls. And the, you apply the pressure to the flow and drive the flow from the pressure gradient. And this is the, the Reynolds number that we are going to play with, R e tau. Here's a U tau is coming from the friction of the wall because it's that's actually related to the velocity scale of the energy dynamics of the system. 
that is a UTEL, that is a, that is the velocity scale of the system. In the near world region, you have a you have a viscosity which is important. So I'm going to use the plus symbol whenever I normalize this with the, the viscous length scale. But the, but the, in all the other case, I'm going to use the uh, the h, which is the half height of channel uh, at the length of scale. Okay, so there are all of these fundamental flow configuration like this: pipe flow, boundary layer, equip flow. Everything is similar. So now the decomposition, the quadrilinear approximation that we are going to use is the same template. But now we are going to do. We assume that that we 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 are going to decompose the velocity field based on mean and fluctuation. Okay, so this is a really the uh, the simplest form of decomposition. And then we can write down the equation from the, for the mean and the rest. Okay, so the problem of this system is channel flow is that this particular uh, the, the mean equation is given here, but this the smooth scale state does not allow any form of the the linear instability. So therefore, if there if n is assumed to be zero, then you only get the trivial solution. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use a minimal model for that, like the need use Rens model. So here I'm going to use the the uh, the add viscosity model, which deal with the energy cascade and nonlinear turbulent transport, and also apply the stochastic forcing to generate non-trivial solutions. Okay. So now question is, these two equations must be consistently combined. So the u and the mean equation must be identical to u in the smooth scale state. Okay. So, but the here. To, but we want that U to be the realistic one, and then forcing is designed to be designed. Forcing wants to be designed such that this forcing generates a realistic uh, mean velocity profile. Okay, but computing, getting the information for n is actually rather tricky because uh, you have to do real, really do DNS and you have to measure the statistics. This is something that you really don't want because it, it, it's it, it gets really complicated. But on the other hand. The mean velocity, which is a historic, historically studied very first, and then there is a very well established physical law. So what we are going to assume is that u is known, and we inversely design f, and and then then this is the the main strategy. So by assuming that u is known from data, is that it has a great advantage because the u is actually most well understood in many cases, even in different geometry, also most easily measurable. And for that for that region, it is the most easily extrapolatable data, okay, with the known physics law. So I'm going to utilize this property. So I'm going to just do some, uh, and then the, what I can do, I measure the mean velocity profile at low random number, I get the fitting curve, and then I, I extrapolate data, the mean velocity, to higher random number, you can do whatever the extrapolation technique that you come up with, with the machine learning and whatsoever. And then this is uh, going to be the, the, the mean velocity profile that I obtained from that kind of model, okay? So it looks like the, it really shows the traditional log low and everything is like consistent with the known physical law, okay? So now what I'm going to do is that I assume that U is known, so therefore that I can compute the range of the stress from that main equation, and that is the coming to here. And then the, now I have to link this with the fluctuation dynamics. And so now what I'm doing is that I compute the, the formulate the fluctuation dynamics from the fluctuation equations. And now what I'm doing, I, I formulate the minimization problem uh, like the, the, such that the, the two quantities become really, really small, subject to the sufficiently smooth uh, the the function in f in spec in in both spectral space and the physical space. Okay, so this is a, some uh, so what we can do we can actually so that that's what we can do in practice in this simple system it's uh, way more simple because of the homogeneity in the geomet uh, geometrical homogeneity in stream wise and span wise directions. So therefore, what you can do we can just solve this problem. And then this this problem can be for, this optimization can be formulated on iterative convex optimization problem to ensure the smoothness of the spectrum by putting penalty term like that they, they did this morning, and then we can also further optimize the penalty term together. Okay, so what? But then let's see what we obtain. So the left column 
and so direct numerical simulation data obtained by Lee and Moser. So the, the high strain was on by Arital 5000, which is very high because it requires roughly one year to get the data with the biggest supercomputer. And then the left is the, 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 the right is the right column is a quadrilinear approximation that I did. Okay. So what you see here is that, that the range of shear stress is something given to the system, but all the others you see that begin to show the qualitatively exactly same trend. Okay, that's the mean velocity fluctuation. And also it predict the classical prediction made by Townsend many years ago. Also, you can you can also check the other velocity fluctuation too, V square. We again see the exactly same qualitative trend. And W square, we also say, see exactly the same qualitative trend. We can also do check the spectra. Okay, so you see that this is the uh, span wide wave number stra, left column is a span wide wave number spectra from DNS, and the right column is also the, the, uh, the now the span wide wave number spectrum for range of stress and stream wide velocity turbulence intensity uh, 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 from quadrilinear approximation. You see that the everything that you see shows uh, exact qualitative uh, match. Okay, the same is true for the other spectra. This is the spectra for uh, volume of velocity fluctuations, and this is the spectra for the stream uh, span-wide velocity fluctuation. You see that the every everything actually follows the, the 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 trend of the DNS. Okay. So you can also study this, you know, for for the hard physics problem, which was which has been matter of debate for a long time. Okay. So one big debate in turbulence community for many years is that. The, this is a peak uh, turbulence intensity here. How did how how does this actually scale with respect to range of sunburn? Okay. So according to classical theory, it should actually follow the logarithmic increase with, with respect to the R tau. Okay. So that was believed actually as a true roughly five years ago, ten years ago, but the the, the new measurement. From the really really big wind tunnel actually installed in in installed in Italy by uh, restructuring the the the, the plane storage they used for World War II, and then the you actually if you measure the data you see that the, the data actually begin to deviate from the uh, classical theory. But what you see here is that this quadrilinear approximation can go to the regime where the DNS is almost impossible, and it shows exactly the same trend. Okay. So oh, let me now conclude my talk quickly. So I, I, I just proposed a quadrilinear approximation for linearly stable flow uh, from extrapolatable data and minimal data with a lot of physical information given. Right, uh, let me use that. So one thing that I should say that the uh, this quadrilinear approximation offers enormous reduction in computational time. And DNS, you know, for if you want to do DNS at Arital 5000, you need to spend one year with the biggest supercomputer with the state art of the parallel code. But quadrilinear approximation, you only need one hour with a laptop. And the, pro uh, the proposed approximation actually, of course, actually uh, can be improved at low range number with the existing data available, and then um, subsequently extended to much higher range number with that information. And the lastly. I mean, the, this morning the Denis shows a lot of use a lot of relevant mode. You can use the relevant mode too in this case, and which offer even cheaper computational cost. So I'm going to finish here. So I'm uh, yeah, I'm happy to take any question.